Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today for our Hobo Thought Leader webinar. This is going to be on tracking temperature to help save coral reefs. I am your host, Taryn Picard. I am the Director of Customer Experience here at Onset. I have been working with data loggers for over 10 years now, and I absolutely love our Hobo data loggers. So a quick little recap of the webinar and how it's going to go. This webinar will run for approximately 45 minutes. We're going to save some time at the end to answer questions for you. So when you're ready, go ahead in the right hand corner of your screen and type in those questions. And I just want to let everyone know that this webinar is being recording, recorded and a link to the recording will be sent out to you about a week after the webinar. So just a quick little cover of who we are and what we do here at Onset. We make Hobo data loggers. We're actually located on Cape Cod in Massachusetts and our sole focus here is building accurate and reliable data logging and monitoring equipment. We are a world leader in data logging with a global network of distributors. We're ISO 9001-2015 certified and we've been in business for over 40 years. So today's presenter, it is my pleasure to introduce Andrea Rivera Sosa. She is the Project and Outreach Manager for the Coral Reef Alliance Global Conservation Science Program. Dr. Rivera Sosa received her doctoral degree in marine science at the Center for Research and Advanced Studies of the National Polytechnic Institute in Mexico. She is a diver, reef monitor, and trainer on coral reef bleaching, stressors, and ecology. She works with multiple groups worldwide to monitor coral reef bleaching and collaborates with conservation scientists globally to improve the Allen Coral Atlas bleaching detection features and coordinates on the ground responses. So with that, I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much for the introduction, Taryn. And thanks to Onset for inviting me today. It's really an enormous pleasure to be sharing with you um, this webinar titled Tracking Temperature to Help Save Coral Reefs. So I work with the Coral Reef Alliance. It's an environmental nonprofit that's on a mission to save the world's coral reefs. We work with communities and partners around the world to keep reefs healthy so that they can adapt to the effects of, of climate change. And coral reefs are amazing, as many of you know. Um, these coral animals build enormous structures that are visible from space. About 25% of all marine life relies on coral reefs, but they only occupy 0.1% of the ocean floor. They protect shorelines by reducing wave by 90%, 97%, and they support approximately 500 million people providing food and income. They're estimated to be worth more than $375 billion per year. And for many people around the world, they play an important cultural role. However, coral reefs are in trouble from local and global threats included climate change. And one of these impacts is marine heat waves, which are increasing coral bleaching events. But there is hope. Our research shows that evolution can help rescue reefs from rising temperatures. And reducing local stressors makes evolution more likely and diversity of corals um, and habitats is also key. So our solution um, is to work at local, regional, and global levels to help reduce threats to coral reefs and do it in a way that allows corals to adapt to the effects of climate change. Um, today, I'm going to talk to you more about this global level. And um, part of the global conservation science team, and our goal is to advance the science and our understanding of how corals adapt to climate change. 
and then build global partnerships and alliances to turn that science into action. In this presentation, I will introduce the science that drives our research. I'll talk about how we're tracking temperature and genetic variability in diverse coral reef habitats of the Bay Islands of Honduras and provide some uh, preliminary results and some um, talk to you about some future and next steps. So the science that drives our work is related to evolution, which is always happening. Uh, so in some cases, conditions may have already led to the selection of organisms that possesses traits necessary for survival. As this slate states, coral genetic traits are primarily determined by evolutionary history and in environmental conditions. For example, some corals in warmer waters have evolved to become more heat tolerant, which means some reefs fare better overall when ocean temperatures increase. In other words, over many generations, corals in warmer water that can stand the heat of higher temperatures have been selected again and again. So these reefs include heat tolerant variants of many coral species. This diagram shows reef A, which contains a diversity of organisms adapted to different temperature conditions. So the red corals, which you see in the diagram, correspond with warm adapted corals, while the blue are adapted to cooler temperatures. And some corals are somewhere in between, as represented by the red or, and the blue DNA. Um, the litter thermometer at the bottom shows overall temperatures in the present day. Now, the next diagram is set 50 years into the future from the previous slides. And as you can see, waters are warming up everywhere. Reef A is historically a warm water reef, and now it's too hot. So more of its corals are beginning to bleach and break down. Fortunately for Reef B, as corals spawn, reefs are connected by the movement of coral larvae through ocean currents, facilitating the spread of heat tolerant genes. This means that heat tolerant corals can spread their heat tolerant larvae to other nearby reefs if they're connected by water currents. So here you can see these little dots which represent the larvae and constitute a mix of cold and heat adapted organisms. So the warm adapted larvae from reef A have helped reef B um, organisms to become adapted to the higher water temperatures. Now, this diagram is set 200 years in the future, and we see that reef A is now completely dead. But because we have a network of reefs with heat adapted corals, they still persist. Heat adapted larvae now dominate and are spread between the connected reefs. So assuming that climate change stabilizes, an important caveat to this work, corals may eventually regrow. So to summarize, we see that over time, heat stress acts on reefs to select corals that can stand higher temperatures. These corals naturally exist in a gene pool that are likely more common in areas where corals have been subjected to high temperatures. So ensuring that we have a network of protected reefs, we can then help warm adapted larvae repopulate other reefs via ocean currents. So putting all these together to harness the power of adaptation and evolution, we recommend management actions across local, regional, and global scales, many of which are already considered best practices. So addressing local stressors is just poor water quality and overfishing to keep corals healthy so they can adapt to climate change, also protect diverse, well-connected reef networks, allowing the exchange of larvae from reefs that are heat adapted to cooler reefs um, that will get warmer with climate change. So what we were talking about before. And finally, we must urgently reduce carbon emissions to give corals a fighting chance. Our modeling work has shown that while genetic variation can be critical in enabling coral reef survival, high emission scenarios will still wipe out all reefs regardless genetic makeup. 
So the key takeaway here is that reducing emissions remains a prerequisite for reef survival. So knowing this, let us do the following research question of, can we calculate metrics of habitat complexity and of thermal and genetic variability from global coral reef available data sets? If so, would it be, it would be hugely useful for designing conservation uh, for adaptation and marine spatial planning efforts. So we partnered with the Allen Core Atlas, which has a map of the world's shallow core reefs with globally consistent benthic and geomorphic layers and a dynamic monitoring system. The Allen Core Atlas is a freely available platform where you can visualize global habitat maps, um, potential turbidity, um, and also potential coral bleaching events. And it uses high resolution Planet Dove satellite imagery, which is um, three meters in, in resolutions. And these images were then used to create different layers by the Arizona State University and the geomorphic and the benthic maps of the world's reefs by the University of, of Queensland. In this schematic, you can see the planet dove imagery to the bottom, and then you can see 12 geomorphic zones, which are our map down to 20 meters. Um, and these show areas such as reef slope, reef crests, or lagoons. And then there's also the benthic map, which shows six different classes. In orange, the combined coral and algae, and other classes such as seagrass, rubble, and sand. So the goal of this project was to track temperature and genetic variability in diverse coral reef habitats of the Bay Islands of, of Honduras. With the Atlas baseline information, we decided to pilot the study of the Bay Islands of Honduras. Here you can see a map of the island of Roatan with the habitat layers on the top and then the geomorphic layers on the bottom. Here you can see the island of Roatan again, but with a map of low beta diversity shown by the uh, blue and up to high beta diversity shown in the yellow. The black dots all over the island show where the tidbits, the hobo tidbit temperature loggers were deployed. And as field data comes in, we're analyzing to see if the Atlas metrics combined with other data sets correlate with temperature and habitat variability as we work to develop ways to consider um, this as an adapted capacity layer in marine spatial planning. In this image, you see an example of low and high beta diversity. To the left, you can see two examples of the Allen Core um, Atlas geomorphic layers. And to the right, you can see areas of low beta diversity to the top and areas of high beta diversity to the bottom. And the field testing component of our study was to assess the habitat and thermal diversity. And this was conducted via field surveys and hobo tidbit deployment. So we selected about 20 sites located in a mix of low and high diversity sites and placed hobo tidbits at the start and at the end of transects um, down to a depth of five to seven meters across all sites. So in between the start and the end of the transects, we conducted photo transects, taking photos of the seafloor um, with a one meter height and one meter apart for areas that were up to four meters, uh, 400 meters long. And we did all of this with a GPS attached to a buoy on the surface so that these photos could be geotagged. Here we see our colleague, um, Daniela Mejia, which is, in, is installing the hobo tidbits to log the temperature and reef sites. And she looked for areas where could, they could be easily attached to the reef and installed small PVC buoys to help also find the sites um, again. And the tidbits, in the small buoy mark the start and the end 
of, of each transect. And one of the greatest features of these new tidbits is that you can download the information via Bluetooth on the boat. In our case, we collected data for about three to five months, and you need to download an application before so that you can download the information and sync the phone to the, um, the tidbit via Bluetooth. And this makes it a very easy and hassle-free um, process. I remember 10 years back when I started my PhD, um, I used to use the regular hobo temperature loggers um, and although they have much lower costs, I had to either bring my computer on the boat, which was nerve wracking considering we worked off um, fishing boats, or I had to bring back the logger to land to download the information. The downloading of data was also possible with the underwater hobo shuttle. Um, but since you didn't see the information, you didn't always know if you had done the procedure right. So in my case, I always brought the logger back to land to make sure that I had the information. And this sometimes increased the travel costs of you know, returning back to the site to deploy the, the logger. But with this new tidbit, you can see the information right away on your phone and you can even link it to Google Drive so that your colleagues can access the information faster from anywhere um, in the world. And as I mentioned before, we used the reel for the GPS um, and then a plumb line for the camera so that each photo could be um, geotagged. And then we used the GPS software developed by the University of Queensland to sync each of the photo of the GPS. The program creates a KML file that is compatible with Google Earth. So when you do a close up to see your georeference transect um, in Google Earth, you're able to visualize the whole trajectory of where you have um, done the transect. And if you click any of the dots, it shows you actually where you took that um, underwater photo. So you can easily track what the reef looks like um, throughout your transect. And all these photos were then analyzed using ReefCloud, which is a new software, uh, photo software analysis tool that uses artificial intelligence to help um, make the classifications of the benthic communities um, much faster. And to show you some of this um, uh, site where we have collected information, um, here you can see the map of Roatan and also the island of Utila, which is another island of the Bay Islands of Honduras. And for the genetic variability component, we selected two of the most common coral species. They're usually fast growing and, and weedy species, Agaricia tonifolia and Poritas astreoides. And we collected about 150 genetic samples for each of the um, each of the colonies. This work was conducted by uh, Mayra Vallecillo in, in situ, and now the um, samples are actually being analyzed um, at the University of Queensland in, in Australia. So this work is still um, underway. And here you can see some of the pre preliminary results of the tidbit sites and some of the data. Um, here on the top panel, you can see the um, um, standard deviation of all temperature loggers, and you can see that temperatures are much more cooler in the beginning of the, of the year. And um, to the right, you can see the island of Roatan and two sites that are highlighted. In yellow, the Duca uh, Luca site on the north, and to the south, the cliff um, site. So you can see how the temperature varies across sites and um, across time. You can also look at um, many indicators of temperature here. Just wanted to show the monthly um, temperature trends. You can see also um, how the whiskers are spaced out um, due to the variability of the temperature, but you can also see how 
uh, temperature seems to be lower in the beginning of the year um, and then starts um, increasing. So some of the next steps is to scale beyond Honduras, this, this type of work. Um, in the first panel, you can see um, some of the different um, areas in the Mesoamerican region. And here there's a close up to um, a, a small reef area. And due to new collaborations with the Hewlett uh, Packard Foundation, um, we're able to have these analysis done faster that were usually um, really hard and very computer intensive. So work that would take weeks um, now take um, seconds. For example, this, um, this area took about uh, 20 seconds to analyze. Um, and the idea is to seek other potential field sites such as Indonesia, the Philippines, or Hawaii, and we're always open to other collaborations to see if um, we can link these, um, these benthic diversity metrics to um, thermal variability. So to finalize, some of the take home messages is that evolution can help rescue reefs from rising temperatures. We're still testing to see if uh, broader layers of the Allen Core Atlas metrics can guide broader scale conservations. Um, we have used the Hobo uh, tidbit loggers to track local temperature variability in coral reef sites. This can also be compared to satellite temperature um, where you can also have more information across broader um, scales. And stay tuned via coral.org to learn more about the results of the project, which are still um, underway. And this has been a result of a huge collaboration with many different organizations and different people working um, on the ground and also in the genetic um, component, and we have received funding from the Builders Initiative, Lida Hill, and also donors from to Coral Reef Alliance. And with that, I will take any questions. Thank you for your time, and thank you for um, for listening to this webinar. Thank you, Audrey. This has been excellent. I really appreciate it. We do have a couple of questions. You had mentioned uh, just a moment ago that you're looking to potentially expand into Indonesia, the Philippines, and Hawaii. One of the questions came up with, how did you choose to start with Honduras? Why was that the primary location when you started looking at where to have uh, start doing some of this research? Okay, yes, great question. So Coral Reef Alliance has two different areas where the, the work is concentrated. One of them is Honduras and one of them is Hawaii. Um, we chose Honduras um, because we have a network of partners also on the ground. So this gave the opportunity to, um, to lay the foundation to start working on the um, uh, tidbit um, installation right away. And also we have um, a lot of information from um, Roatan in particular. So this was, and, and Utila, the Bay Islands in general. So these were the, the sites that were chosen for that um, connection uh, with partners and previous work. Excellent, thank you. Another question is, uh, you had shown some images of you attaching the tidbit temperature data logger directly to the coral itself. Did that cause any stress to the coral? Um, did you see it have any negative impact or do you feel it was small enough, light enough and, and weight where it, it really didn't affect it in an, a negative way? That is a, a great question. Um, the sites or the location that was um, identified for the attachment of the Hobo tidbit were locations that there was no live coral um, that was um, always one of the criteria uh, because we obviously don't want to cause any damage by touching or rubbing against um, a live coral. So areas that didn't have live coral 
were chosen. So in the image, I showed an area that has like crustose coralline algae, but no um, live coral. Excellent, thank you. So that kind of answered another question about where is it best to place the tidbit? Um, but if you could just go in a little bit more of a detail, was there a certain elevation or were you looking at specific you know, areas where to put it or where you'd recommend you're getting the best data? Sure. So I think where and where and what depth you choose will depend a lot of on your research question. In this case, we wanted to keep the depth at um, a constant. So we try to keep our sites between five to seven meters. That was our range. And then when we chose the, the location where the tidbit was also attached, then um, we tried to keep it um, within areas that had no live coral. And then also um, usually try to see places where you can you know, take a picture and then you can easily find the area again, because even though you have a GPS and you have the area um, mapped, sometimes finding your your spot might might be hard. So we we tried to pick like um, pretty obvious sites that would make it easier to to return. I hope that answers the question. <laughs> Yes, excellent. Thank you so much. I will ask you another one here. Uh, if hot temperatures are killing corals, why would uh, if why would you be looking to plant them more corals? It, isn't that just going to eventually cause them to die because of global warming, or uh, kind of what is the benefit to planting more? So there are many um, reasons why there's restoration projects. So. Um, restoration can be done um, by um, cutting the, the coral and, and replanting, but also there's um, sexual reproduction where um, the, the larvae or the eggs are brought to the lab and then they're settled into um, different substrates and then planted back onto the reef. So there's many strategies. Um, the idea of having um, restoration projects that work um, will depend on minimizing all those stressors that I mentioned before, because if we keep all the stressors such as water quality um, or pollution the same in, in different areas, then we're not making the, the environment healthier for coral soup to survive. Um, some other projects look into um, choosing already heat tolerant corals to, um, to do restoration projects. So there's many, there's many strategies. We, Coral Reef Alliance doesn't actually do restoration. Um, we try to work with reducing the, the stressors to reefs and also assessing this evolution uh, potential of, you know, saving those sites that can be um, like the, the future seeds for, for other areas. Excellent, thank you. Uh, another question, are you looking at both gene expression patterns and DNA sequencing between coral populations? Okay, that is a great question. And, um, we have not started, so I'm not in the genetic, <laughs> in the genetic team. Um, we have Cynthia Rignos and Ilya uh, from the University of Queensland, and also uh, Maida Vallecillo from the University of, of Chile, um, who are in the, um, in the genetic team. So I am not sure what are the um, particular indicators that we're going to be looking into the genetic component. But if you can write your your email, I'll be happy to to connect with you with with the right answer on the variables. Well, thank you. I'm going to answer this one because there's about three questions and hopefully my explanation will answer all of them at once. Um, but questions around 
you know, how are you using the data loggers? How are you offloading the data? And can they be combined or paired with satellite transmitters? And I will explain quickly that uh, the data loggers that you are using in the field actually use uh, Bluetooth communication. So they cannot be connected to satellite. Also, Bluetooth communication does not transmit through water. So that is the reason you're, you and your team were bringing them back to the boat to offload the data. Um, and one of the nice things about using Bluetooth communication is you don't actually have to open up the data logger itself to connect anything to it. Uh, you simply can use either your phone or um, a Windows app you can download to, so you can have it straight going to your computer. But you do have to be in about a 100 foot range. And again, it won't communicate through water. Um, it does offer cellular stations that will transmit data remotely to the cloud. So if that's something people are interested in, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to our application team and they can help you. All right, I'll jump on to a, another question here. What camera do you use to mark the underwater transfer with GPS? What, uh, if you could answer that, that would be great. Yes, um, we use the Olympus Tough 6, G6, I believe, yeah. Um, but it should work with other cameras as well, but I, I feel like that's the best one we have um, used in terms of um, linkage um, with, the, with the GPS. And with the GPS, we just use a regular um, Garmin um, E-Trex 10, I believe. Um, yeah, sorry, I didn't put pictures of the of the equipment, but um, the there's a whole um, presentation about how to do that linkage. So I would refer you to the um, Coral website and actually to the Coral YouTube channel because there there's some explanations on how to do that. Um, linkage, but anybody can can do it. Excellent, thank you. Uh, next question: How did benthic organisms at cliff and non-cliff sites vary with temperature? Did the cliff sites support more diversity, number of organisms, etc.? Okay, um, great question. I I don't have all the data for for all the different sites. We're still analyzing the the information so i not sure but from the from the habitat diversity met, uh, metrics duca luca um has a a higher diversity than than cliff but i will also yes definitely um if you can write your email I'll be happy to to connect with you when we have more of the of the results. Perfect, thank you. Uh, next question, what other environmental variables would be useful in characterizing stressors? Have you considered looking at things like salinity or turbidity or even pH? Yes, um, so there are different uh, variables that can be added to to the analysis, so um, environmental variables such as currents are a big, a big one. Um, there's many studies that um, have assessed that areas that have higher flow um, usually have like higher recovery rates from bleaching, for example. Um, tur turbidity is a good one, but it can also go both ways because areas that are highly, highly turbid. Um, can also have more tolerant um, corals to turbidity or the composition of corals that may be present in that area might be more um, tolerant. But if you have more um, localized stressors such as um, um, wastewater, for example, uh, which is an anthropogenic um, stressor. So looking at water quality is a big, um, and it's a it's a good recommendation because there's many studies that um, don't have water quality information, and sometimes this can reveal many of the um, unknowns. 
So yes, I would suggest, if possible, um, water quality. And actually, um, some of these sites were also nearby water quality um, sites that were assessed by um, partners and Coral Reef Alliance partners. So that's another, um, yeah, that's another variable that we can look at. But those are the ones that, yeah, I recommend. Salinity is also um, a good one if you're working in areas where you have a lot of runoff also. Excellent, thank you. Um, I am just gonna answer this next question here for you. Um, so the data logger you're using in these images is Onsets MX2204, which is a version of the tidbit logger that is sealed in epoxy. So that one right there, um, it is sealed in epoxy and it's rated to depths of 1500 meters or 5,000 feet. The one that is shown in the boat image offloading the data is the MX2203. Uh, that one has a lower depth rating, but it is uh, offered with a user replaceable battery. So you do have that benefit. And that one I believe is rated right around to uh, 400 feet. I can double check that one. Uh, next question I have here is how do you coordinate a local response when you identify a coral bleaching event? Okay. That is a that is a great question. So, depending where you are in the world, um, there's usually a a group, a leading group, um, or a network of responders who go out and monitor um, reefs. So, what we're doing with the Allen Core Atlas, and this is something that um, is still on the works, and I will return to this slide um, here. So here's a, um, an image showing the bleaching detection tool from the Allen Core Atlas. Um, this works near real time because it's every two, it's bi-weekly, so every two weeks, you will have information about um, particular, well, sites all over the world um, which have, um, which have um, a bleaching alert from NOAA. So it works with um, the NOAA Coral Reef Watch alert system. So when that is triggered, then it cues the Allen Core Atlas to start monitoring um, that area. We are working on a alert system. Um, this past year has been um, a year of working on strengthening the algorithm itself um, because this is a new, um, it's in its beta phase, so it's a new um, detection system. And so the next step um, is going to be to have an alert system where uh, people who are signed up to the website, for example, can receive alerts from different areas um, where potential core bleaching events um, might be occurring. And the respond ideally is that there's already an organized team with a set methodology. Um, we have different trainings on the YouTube channel to, to tailor to the world because different places have different methodologies. Um, so ideally you wanna have a trained team that can go out and then collect data um, on the on the site, and then also do a follow up because many reefs may be affected, but may also recover. So it's always good to have that um, information. And um, we're working with different organizations that already have these teams set up, such as, for example, Reef Check, which is a large um, organization that trains citizen scientists. So they also have a platform where they collect the data. Um, we're also working with, um, with Reef Cloud, which is um, based on the photo um, methodology. And um, Mermaid um, is also a, um, an organization that works with the Wildlife Conservation Society, which has a rapid bleach, bleaching protocol. And 
also, for example, in the Caribbean, there's Agra. Um, so there's many, there's many different, you know, response teams depending on the geographic location. But if you're more, if you're interested in learning more about um, how to collaborate with us, please send me um, an email and we'll love to, to connect with you. Excellent, thank you. Um, have you ever worked with BioRock? And if so, what is your experience with using it? Is it uh, working or not? Okay. Uh, I do not have any experience with, with BioRock. So I apologies. <laughs> I don't have um, a straight answer for you. All right. Have you noticed in areas with better water circulation if bleaching events are less frequent? Uh, what was the question again? Sorry, Taryn. That's okay. Have you noticed in areas with better water circulation if bleaching events are less frequent? Okay. Um, so um, I have not seen it firsthand, but I have read some some studies where despite having um, high heat stress, if there is more water flow or water currents that can bring cooler water so there's faster recovery rates. I can think of a case, for example, in, um, in Colombia where there's an upwelling area. And so even though there was high heat stress and there was bleaching occurring, there was a, a faster um, recovery. Uh, how much variation were you seeing between the uh, hobo data loggers actually in the water and then the satellite that was being used to determine temperature? Oh, yes, that's a that's a great question. Um, I actually did the comparison for my um, previous work for my PhD. And what we were able to see is that the, um, the temperature loggers and the satellite have about one degree. Um, up to 1.5 degree um, difference. Wow, that is uh, much more accurate than I thought you were going to say. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. With rising temperatures, is establishing cooler preference coral in more northern locations where the water is cooler a viable option? Yes, so one of the things that I was um, talking about in, in this component of evolution and where we set the uh, protected areas, it's important to have a network. So having areas where uh, potentially you have cooler waters now um, is quite important because those are the areas where you're going to have warmer uh, temperatures in, in the future. But you also need to protect the areas that are um, currently in, in the hot spots um, per se, like areas that are really warm now, uh, because that larvae um, from these tolerant um, reef areas will be critical for seeding those other um, cooler areas. So yeah, so having a network of, me like for example, um, warm, medium, and cold um, reefs is, is important. Fantastic. Um, so I'll answer the next one. Yes, uh, Onset does make a variety of hobo data loggers that uh, do support different water quality measurements. I may follow up with the water quality question earlier. So um, you feel free to contact again one of our application specialists and they certainly can help you if you're looking to measure a particular water quality parameter. Uh, and the last one I'll answer as well, the battery life on the pendants is typically around three to five years. Again, we offer one version that has a user replaceable battery and another version that's rated for depths up to um, 5,000 feet, and that one is sealed in epoxy, so you cannot replace the battery. Um, so with that, I think we're, oh, one more. Um, if you don't mind just kind of talking about your experience offloading data on the boat, had you have you used other 
on devices in the past where you needed a computer and did you find it beneficial using a uh, cell phone as shown in that image this time instead? Sure. So yes, I was I was talking about before about 10 years back looking at um, when I started my PhD, I was using the, um, the different um, loggers. So I had the, um, the Hubble um, shuttle. And so I would have to bring back the, um, the, the logger. Um, and then I did it a few times. I brought my computer on the boat so that I could check the data um, on the boat and then jump right on um, to the water and deploy the, um, the logger. But this was a bit nerve wracking because having your computer on a boat can be tricky. Um, if it's, you know, it could be your school computer, your work computer, this was my personal computer. So I was extra careful to, you know, not get it wet. Um, so I did that a few times where I knew that um, it was going to be hard to return to that site because it was either too far away or just to save time and, and costs. But now with the with this new um, Hobo Tidbit um, logger, it makes it much easier to download the data on the boat because Everybody has a phone. Everybody has a smartphone nowadays. So you can download the app and actually see how you're um, downloading the data and you can save it right away. So you don't have to go back to land, go back to the lab to, to do that process. It's quite um, fast, it's easy, and then you can even download it onto a Google, Google Drive that you can share it with other people. So the information is available much faster. So, so yeah, I, I definitely recommend it. Excellent. Well, I'm gonna thank you again. That actually brings us to the end. We're perfect on timing here and uh, we're out of questions. So I just wanna remind everyone that we will be sending out a link to the recording of this webinar and wanna thank everyone so much for joining us today. But most importantly, thank you, Andrea, for this fantastic presentation. Uh, we really appreciate you taking the time today to share all of this very insightful information and we're, we're really great to see the research that you're doing. So thank you for taking the time to present today and thank you again, everyone for joining us. Thank you very much and stay tuned for, for more of the results. Thank you again for sticking through the webinar. Alrighty, have a great day.